Good evening. Welcome to Evening Prayer for Monday, November the 20th. Today is the commemoration of the Lament of Rome Pastor. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let my prayer rise before you as incense. The lifting up of my hands is the evening sacrifice. The joyous light of glory of the immortal Father, heavenly, holy, blessed Jesus Christ. We have come to the setting of the sun, and we look to the evening light. We sing to God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You are worthy of being praised with pure voices forever. O Son of God, O giver of life, the universe proclaims your glory. The Lord Almighty grant us a quiet night and peace at the last. Amen. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praise to your name, O Most High, to herald your love in the morning, your truth at the close of the day. Praise to you, O Christ. O come, let us worship him. Lord Jesus, stay with us, for the evening is at hand and the day is past. Be our constant companion on the way. Kindle our hearts and awaken hope among us, that we may recognize you as you are revealed in the scriptures and in the breaking of the bread. Grant this for your name's sake. Amen. O Lord, make me know my end and what is the measure of my days. Let me know how fleeting I am. Behold, you have made my days a few handbreadths and my lifetime is as nothing before you. Surely all mankind stands as a mere breath. Surely a man goes about as a shadow. Surely for nothing they are in turmoil. Man heaps up wealth and does not know who will gather. And now, O Lord, for what do I wait? My hope is in you. Deliver me from all my transgressions. Do not make me the scorn of the fool. I am mute. I do not open my mouth. For it is you who have done it. Remove your stroke from me. I am spent by the hostility of your hand. When you discipline a man with rebukes for sin, you consume like a moth what is dear to him. Surely all mankind is a mere breath. Hear my prayer, O Lord, and give ear to my cry. Hold not your peace at my tears. For I am a sojourner with you, a guest like all my fathers. Clement lived between approximately A.D. 35 and A.D. 100, and he is remembered for having established the pattern of apostolic authority that governed the Christian church during the first and second centuries. He also insisted on keeping Christ as the center of the church's worship and outreach. In a letter to the Christians at Corinth, he emphasized the centrality of Jesus' death and resurrection. Let us fix our eyes on the blood of Christ, realizing how precious it is to his Father since it was poured out for our salvation, and brought the grace of repentance to the whole world. 1 Clement 6.31 Prior to suffering a martyr's death by drowning, Clement displayed a steadfast, Christ-like love for God's redeemed people, serving as an inspiration to future generations to continue to build the church on the foundation of the prophets and apostles, with Christ as the one and only cornerstone. New Testament reading tonight is from the Revelation to St. John, chapter 20. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain. And he seized the dragon, that ancient serpent who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years, and threw him into the pit, and shut it, and sealed it over him, so that he might not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be released for a little while. Then I saw thrones, and seated on them were those to whom the authority to judge was committed. Also, I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. And when the thousand years are ended, Satan will be released from his prison, and he will come out to deceive the nations that are at the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. Their number is like the sand of the sea. And they marched up over the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. But fire came down from heaven and consumed them. And the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur, 
where the beast and the false prophet were, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. From his presence earth and sky fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and the books were open. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books, according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it, death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Now, as Lutherans, we should probably say a few things about the thousand years, the millennium. For most of American evangelicals, that thousand years is wanted to be taken literally. Uh, it is not a thousand, literal thousand year period of time. Um, we take the interpretation of the Bible literally, but we also uh, do that with an ear toward what kind of literature we're reading is. And there are several different types of literature in the Bible. Uh, the book of Revelation is apocryphal. And uh, apocryphal, apocalyptic, excuse me, apocalyptic. Apocalyptic literature always has to do with the end times, uh, but it is written in symbolic and coded language. Uh, so it is not to be read literally. So the thousand years is actually the period since Jesus ascended into heaven and before he comes again. Uh, so that is how we interpret that thousand years, or earlier in the book it's called the Great Tribulation. Uh, that's taking place right now. It has been ever since Jesus ascended into heaven. It's going to keep taking place till he comes again. So all these things in these uh, wonderful images that we see that are drawn from the Old Testament and Revelation, those are not things that are going to happen in the future uh, at some certain date, and all of a sudden you'll see these things happening. They're happening right now. And they have been happening, and they will continue to happen. Uh, so we don't read this as a literal thousand years, is the big takeaway. So basically, this time that uh, the devil is uh, going to be released for a little while, that will be very close to the end. Uh, and that kind of gets a little confusing. That almost sounds uh, paradoxical, because I just said we don't take this literally. But we do take that where Satan is kind of unleashed, that it's going to get really, really bad before the end. Uh, and people say, oh, look how bad it is now. Uh, no, you haven't seen anything. Uh, so now the devil cannot uh, deceive us because Jesus has revealed himself to the world as the Savior. So those who believe, those who do not worship the false gods, those that don't listen to the false prophets, they're okay. The devil is not uh, deceiving them. They, may, they are tempted to sin. But he can't deceive them. He can't pull the wool over their eyes and pretend to be Jesus. That is uh, clear. So it's an interesting book, not the scope of evening prayer to do a Bible study on Revelation. Just be aware that uh, you don't read it like a story. Uh, you don't read it like a storybook uh, from beginning to end. If you do that, you get in a lot of trouble. Um, I have, there are many Bible studies available which are Lutheran that will explain our interpretation. And I have lots of resources. If you ever want to see any of them, just ask. I'll be happy to loan them to you. That's about that. Enough about that for tonight. Our first reading with Luther tonight is about Genesis chapter 27, verses 42 and 43. Rebecca said to him, Watch out. Your brother Esau is comforting himself by planning to kill you. So now, son, obey me. Quick, run away to my brother Laban in Haran doing what you can. Rebecca shows her wisdom in sending Jacob away to avoid Esau's anger. She didn't test God by saying, the one, who, the one who blessed you will also care for you, and let it go at that. To be sure, whatever God wants will indeed happen, but he uses people and things to accomplish what he wants. Rebecca believed that the worship of God and the blessing entrusted to Jacob would be protected, so she made use of what God had provided to find a way for Jacob to avoid danger. Those who assume God will take care of everything and don't think it's important to make use of what's available should carefully note this example. These type of people sometimes don't take any action because they believe that if something is meant to happen, then it will happen with or without their help. They even put themselves in unnecessary danger, expecting God to protect them because of his promises. 
But these kinds of thoughts are sinful because God wants you to use what you have available and make the best of your opportunities. He wants to accomplish his will through you. For example, he gave you a father and mother even though he could have created you and fed you without them. This means that in your everyday life, you have the responsibility to work. You plow, plant, and harvest, but God is the one who provides the outcome. If you stopped giving a baby milk, reasoning that the baby could live without food, if you were meant to live, then you would be fooling yourself and sinning. God has given mothers breasts to nurse their babies. He could easily feed children without milk if he chose to, but God wants you to use the resources he has provided. And that, that's plain speech right there. That's, uh, I always think of that country song, Jesus Take the Wheel. Uh, no, Jesus is not going to take the wheel. He wants you to use your reason and your senses and your ability to drive that car out of the situation you find yourself in. So just throwing up your hands and going, okay, Jesus, whatever is your will, uh, you will get what you deserve by abandoning reason and abandoning your ability. As God works through other people, he works through you or your neighbor. He works through your neighbor for, through you. Of preaching tonight, <laughs> but uh, a lot of people uh, just throw up their hands sometimes and thinks, "Oh yeah, God will take care of this. Uh, he will do what He wants to happen will happen anyway." And He can't do that. That's not how God operates. We join together in the Apostles' Creed in the Lord's Prayer. I believe in God the Father Almighty, Maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Backwards. There we go. O Lord, merciful and holy bridegroom, we grieve the fall of your church. It is our fault that the beauty of your bride is no longer recognized. Therefore, we pray you, give and increase in us faith, love, and hope in you. Root out of us all sins and vice, all strife, all disbelief, all error and heresy. Rebuke the erring, convert the unbelievers. Bring the rebellious again to the unity of the Christian Church, and show them the light of your truth. Protect our shepherd from all danger of body and soul. Bless all pastors and those who administer in the church in the building of your congregation. Grant them success in all things. Equip your whole church with the power and proof of the holy faith. Stand by your witnesses among the nations and further the course of your gospel in all the world. Fill all government with the fear of you and let their ruling serve to foster and preserve peace. Have mercy on our people and our country. Let the youth be brought up in discipline and in a right knowledge of you, so that they may recognize your law in the way of your salvation. Give constancy and loyalty to all pious teachers. Comfort all the troubled and sorrowful. Impart health of body and soul to the sick. Grant to all pregnant women according to your mercy a happy result in their childbearing. To the needy give bodily and spiritually according to your good pleasure. Let those who travel be commended to the protection of your holy angels, and be a strong help to all who need you. For the sake of your holy wounds, O Jesus. Amen. Almighty God, your servant Clement of Rome called the church in Corinth to repentance and faith to unite them in Christian love. Grant that your church may be anchored in your truth by the presence of the Holy Spirit and kept blameless in your service until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A shorter motion with Luther tonight.
is based on Luke 14, 24. I tell you, none of those men who were invited shall taste my banquet. Christ's banquet. It is as if Jesus meant to say, well, my supper too is something and is surely better than their oxen, fields, and houses or wives, even though they now despise it and regard their fields, oxen, and houses as much more precious. The hour will come when they must leave their oxen, fields, and houses, and would gladly taste something for my supper. But then it will be said, friend, I am not now at home, and I cannot now wait on the guests. Go to your fields, to your oxen, to your houses. They will certainly give you a better supper, because you have despised my supper so confidently and boldly. I have certainly cooked for you and spent much on it, but that is offensive to you. If now you have cooked something better, then eat and be cheerful, except that you will not taste my supper. We, however, who accept it, and with hearts frightened because of our sins, do not decline the grace of God, which is preached and offered to us in the gospel through Christ, will receive grace instead of wrath, eternal righteousness instead of sin, and eternal life instead of eternal death. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day, and I pray that you would forgive me all my sins where I have done wrong, and graciously keep me this night. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul, and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good night.